the way we're going to do this now is John is going to kick it off with his presentation and his thoughts on the post-corona, the new paradigms, the new world. Um, and then I will follow with my short presentation, which is only about 10 hours. No, just kidding. I'll keep it short. And then we're going to have a debate and discussion and pick up on your questions remotely as well. So with that, John, why don't you, uh, why don't you dive right. in? Again, asked if I would speak for 10 minutes about capitalism, climate, inequality, and collaboration, uh, which I will do. And uh, I'll overlay it with what I see as a very hopeful scenario, which is the increasing uh, acknowledgement of the power of play. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. To begin, though, paradigms. I was watching James Lovelock the other day. He turned 101. And I was thinking, what a lovely example of a paradigm shift from someone who looked at the world as a mass of chemicals to seeing it as a living organism and a self-regulatory organism. So today I want to talk about paradigms. We've, we've shifted paradigms many times. Uh, we've seen ourselves as the center of the universe and now we're, we're stuck somewhere uh, out on the outskirts of it. But really, um, when we think about paradigms, it is our beliefs that shape our reality. We don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. And we bring our cultural backpack to that. And we also bring our privilege and our biases. It's also beholden to all of us, really, to, to have choice. We all have choice. And it's our choices that define who we are. And it'll define how we get on moving forward. The world hasn't really changed in terms of paradigms. You know, we've been going shopping, we've been sleeping, we've been going to work, we've been doing things the way that we have been doing things because that's the way that they are. And if we look at institutions for the last 50, 100 years, they haven't really changed very much. But what we're seeing now is we're seeing sameness at the same time as change. And the two trends that we can see with that change is that it's coming faster and it's more complex in the way that it's arriving. So um, what do we do? We're faced with things that we've never been faced with before. We're being asked to make decisions about things we have no information about. We don't have data that informs anymore. So we're forced to inventing new possibilities for ourselves. And uh, President Macron was uh, earlier on in the year famously quoted as saying, you know, we, we have no choices left but to invent a future for ourselves. So this then means, well, how do we do that? You know, when you look out to the stars, there's an infinite mass out there and in terms of our understanding, perhaps one of those bright little specks, if we're generous, you know, we really don't know very much. And their answers to our issues actually exist, I believe, in that unknown space, in that unknown territory. So how do we navigate that unknown territory? Well, as I mentioned earlier, there's a renaissance in play. Plato described play as the leap. And in order to leap, you have to play with the ground and understand how you can use the ground to actually leverage yourself higher. And on the other side, you have to learn how to land safely. So the lift off and the landing. And we as humans, animals, we all learn this, not through instruction, but through trying it out and play. Evolutionarily, play has enabled us to be here. It would have been bred out of us if it didn't have a role. And as Einstein said, it's actually the purest form of research available to us. This is a picture of me uh, in March, just before lockdown uh, at the Taj Mahal, jumping and expressing my playfulness. Some, uh, I think, misunderstanding has been around around play, that actually play is uh, a waste of time, or it's something you do in your free time, or it's the opposite of work. This is uh, not true at all. The opposite uh, of play is actually depression, 
when you think about it, you know, many people right now are in fear and fear actually kind of narrows your peripheral vision and it also narrows your thinking process and your ability to think outside the box or to think of something completely new beyond the box. I believe it's super powerful and it's one of the tools that we can use to navigate our way forward. Sadly, I have to say around play is we're not seeing it happening enough in our schools. Kids are uh, less and less playing, which means that their play histories are not going to be rich. And uh, Dr. Stuart Brown did some research and showed that the play histories of psychopaths were very, very limited. So I think one of the things that we need to do is, is, is instill more free play in our kids in order for them to be the future that we need. It's difficult because creativity and play, those are things you can't measure, but because you can't measure them doesn't mean they don't have value. I'd like to try a little activity with you, please. Um, I'm hoping you have a pen and paper or, or pencil and paper with you. Um, I'd like you to write down with your dominant hand. For most people, that would be your, your right hand. Um, I'd like you to write down a question about a challenge that you're facing right now. And if you could frame that question, please, as a WH question, that's a what or a how or a why or something like that. And let me just give you a moment just to write that down. And if you don't have a piece of paper there, just write it with your finger. It's important to actually go through the physical action of writing. So just take a moment and write down a challenge, a question about a challenge you face. Now I can't see you, I don't know how far you've got with that. So I'll give you a few more, a few more seconds. Now taking the pen, I'm right-handed. What I'd like you to do, please, once you've finished writing your question, is to pass the pen into your other hand, your less dominant hand. And if you could, an answer to your question using your other hand. And again, let's just take a moment for you to do this. Now, the purpose of this exercise really is just to shift paradigms, to go from one hemisphere of the brain to the other. Um, you're forced by writing in, the, in, in your less dominant hand, you're forced to think about a sentence that's quite short because your writing is not so great. You're also using different aspects of your brain. And hopefully you've come up with an answer that maybe surprises or that you didn't know existed there um, but it's just an example, a very short example of how we can quickly change paradigms and through that actually get different perspectives and different answers to issues. So <laughs> capitalism, what an enormous topic. My belief is we've we've been kidnapped by capitalism. You know, we're now working for capitalism rather than capitalism working for us. And uh, it's pretty evident that the current systems are no longer working for the majority of us. In New Zealand, um, we have some shifts happening. We have a government that is more interested in long-term social well-being than, than short-term uh, profit, I believe. Um, we've got new language coming in. So, so one of those new uh, pieces of vocabulary is talk of a heart of state rather than a head of state. Uh, we also have talk in Parliament of tax being love. So rather than paying tax, you're actually giving love to people in, in need. So these kinds of reframing of things. New Zealand signed up just uh, before Christmas to a zero carbon legislation. And so it's on its way towards that. There's also quite a movement here for a regenerative and circular economy and uh, local councils are starting to come on board with that. So we are seeing change. It's certainly not all rosy. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of discrepancy here and, and inequality here. I mean, health being one of them. You know, we live in a, a country that, or I live in a country that uh, has systems that were bought by colonizers and uh, a monocultural system. And really now those are being challenged um, in terms of health outcomes for Maori and, and uh, European Pākehā who've arrived. There's a 10 year gap 
in, in longevity, and that needs to be closed. And in part of that closing, it's the decolonizing of the, um, the systems. So that's, that's a movement that I think is happening not just in New Zealand, but around the world. In the bigger uh, view of inequality, I mean, these figures are just shocking, aren't they? You know, when you think that there's half a billion people that have moved into absolute poverty this year due to coronavirus, half a billion, you know, how do we, how do we even get our heads around that? And that the number of people dying from hunger is going to double, double. That's 18 million from 9 million. Now, we know what the vaccine is for hunger. The question is, you know, are we really willing to make the choices? Are we really willing to share? Are we really willing to change the situation? A situation where you have half of the world's wealth in the hands of 1% of the population. Now, when it comes to climate emissions, um, there's a lot of talk of individual action and absolutely, we all have a role to play. But this doesn't let the corporates off the hook. I was amazed, you know, that 25 businesses have actually contributed to half of the global emissions. So there's enormous responsibility and individuals probably don't have the power without collective action or government action to bring these uh, organizations into check because they don't seem to be self-regulating uh, fast enough for us. So, you know, what do we face? We face uh, a future where radical change is required if change is going to happen. Uh, if we leave it, we're actually on, you know, it's incremental or exponential rather, it's not incremental at all, it's exponential, the curve. And, you know, it's too late to teach somebody to swim when they're drowning. So we've got this call for action, uh, and we've got people around the world who are answering that call. Many of the solutions have already been found. There's a lovely film, 2040, that shows many of the answers that are available to us right now. So it's about collective will, it's about collective action. And it's about thinking of a new future with solutions that we don't even know about yet. You know, and, and capitalism itself, perhaps if we're still using that word, we're not thinking hard enough about what a new paradigm could really be and really do for us. So, Gerd, that really is, uh, in a short presentation, my view uh, on things right now. I believe together we can have change. And I do believe that being playful and finding answers in the unknown is going to serve us well.